Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Really exciting one, one that has been in the works for a very long time. Um, and I've been looking forward to being able to share this with you, not only the risk score itself, but also get James in, who I will introduce properly very soon. Still plenty of people coming online, but I think we will kick off um, as regular webinar attendees will know, I talk about Credit Watch for a couple of minutes anyway, so not too much that people will miss out on and I'm conscious of everyone's time. So thank you for joining us today. Of course, today we're talking about our brand new risk score, which we officially launched all, um, all users and the public and the media last week on Monday. It's been live for, for a week. Extremely, extremely good reception um, from everyone. Of course, there's always a few little queries here or there when you make such big changes, um, but we're extremely happy with the results. As always, a little bit about Creditor Watch. Um, commercial Credit Reporting Bureau with over 50,000 customers now across Australia. Our users are all shapes and sizes, all industries, all locations, big, small, medium, etc. So it's great to have online small sole traders um, all the way up to some of the biggest uh, banks and companies in Australia. I had a little quick peek at the attendee list before we got started today. So. Um, with that in mind, um, we'll obviously tailor today's webinar to make sure that it works for everyone. Um, but as you know, Creditor Watch is business agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you have a business doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or a couple of billion, the solution works and scales um, in line with that. And the risk score is no different, which James will talk about as well. Key highlights, now I usually sort of brush over this slide a little bit, but it's actually really important for today's discussion, for today's webinar, because all of the data that we are capturing from our customers, from our data sources, um, plays a huge role in the risk score and a, a huge role in determining uh, the score itself, the credit rating, et cetera. And of course, um, the big ones there, probably on the right hand side for you, the 10 million trade lines that we're getting on a monthly basis from the likes of accounting integration with Xero and MYOB, but also from the um, uploads of age trial balances, ATVs, generally on a fortnightly or monthly basis. All of that data, super rich, super predictive, um, and forms a large part of um, how the score is determined and the risk that that business represents to your business. Um, dozens and dozens of public, private, government data sources being utilised as well. Um, and we are generating a huge number of scores off the back of that, and even more now since we launched just over a week ago, which is really exciting. So as I've said, today is about Risk Score, which is our brand new um, score that we launched a week ago. It replaces the previous Credit Watch credit score that we had um, for probably about five or six years. There's been plenty of questions about what's the difference. Well, I've got the man who is going to look after all of those questions for me. I just get to buy questions at him and James will be able to answer them for us. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm looking forward to getting started. James O'Donnell is the Managing Director of Open Analytics. James, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having us. James has been working um, with his fantastic team on this risk score for, I would say, about 12 months, give or take a couple of weeks. Um, it was a project that when we, when we started, we thought, that's probably something we can knock out in a couple of months. Um, and then once James and the team got into the amount of data and saw exactly how much data there was, it was a sort of uh, wide-eyed, jaw-dropping experience for them to go, James, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much here. Um, it might take a little bit longer, but it's certainly a good problem to have. Um, so James is, is what we call a credit risk expert. He's working mainly with, um, with the big four banks, but also plenty of those new neo banks as well that are going through the ADI licensing process. Um, he has been creating credit risk scores, models, et cetera, for how long? Ooh, almost 15 years now. At least 15 years um, and continues to do that. He's been out, um, has his own business, Open Analytics, 
um, for a bit over three years now, which is great. Um, saw the light to move into the private sector away from working for the mayor. Yeah, I think, I think maybe sharing a bit of, of the, the smarts that we see the big banks outside of the big banks is probably a good way to, to think about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what's um, what's great about it is while the banks have had access to, you know, um, fantastic credit risk modelling, scoring, et cetera, for years and years and years and years, it's something that businesses under the banking, you know, the banking market or businesses of banking size have, have certainly not had that same sort of access. But by working with Open Analytics, Credit Watch has been able to bring together our data with the smarts and the expertise of James and his team um, to create a, a fantastic product that, that works ultimately for, for businesses of all sizes. It doesn't yeah. really matter, does yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah. Did you want to touch on anything else about Open Analytics or did you want to just... Oh, I don't think that's a pretty good background. So look, we specialise in, in credit management and really specifically what we specialise in is applying machine learning for, for credit processing. Yeah. So what we typically do is build credit rating systems and credit scoring models for, for the big banks but also other institutions. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Well, with that in mind, big first question, what are the real differentiators that make this score more predictive? Yeah. So look for any rating system or scoring model, what what really, what ultimately matters in terms of driving the predictive value really boils down to two things. So number one is the data that's available to that credit scoring system. And number two is the design of the credit scoring algorithm, or in other words, how you use the data that, that you have available. So for risk score, in terms of the overarching design, uh, there's probably two key things to, to call out. So number one, we're using a, a segmented scoring algorithm. So we've actually got five distinct credit scoring systems under the hood, as it were, for, for risk score. Um, so we have di different uh, models that are segmented by the type of entity and in some cases the tax status. So look, the reason we do that is that there tend to be quite different predictors of defaults and insolvencies and different relationships for different types of businesses. So for example, larger public companies have quite different looking predictors compared to say regular sort of smaller private companies and partnerships. Um, so you've got sole traders of course, which are individuals, which are quite different again. And then trust, trust structures are, can be quite also quite different as well. So key point number one is actually five separate scoring algorithms. Point number two, we're using quite advanced statistical methods. So methods that are broadly described as machine learning. I thought a lot about the best way to, to explain that and con convey that without getting too technical, but probably the best way to think about machine learning methods when you compare them to more traditional credit scoring approaches is that they're really good at combining and synthesizing a much broader volume and range of data and sort of compressing that into a single rating system. So when you compare a model design using these machine learning methods to a more sort of traditional, the more common approaches, what from a practical point of view, what we'll tend to see is a larger number of data elements and predictors ingested by that model. And the second point is you can also bring in data structures that can't normally be used in credit rating systems. So a good example in, in these models, we're using what are called natural language processing techniques. So this is a way we can actually scrape data from ABR and, and ASIC and actually make use of text data. So you, you can't normally put text data into a credit rating system, but we've got quite a novel application here where essentially identifying high risk and low risk um, industries using using this text data algorithm. So that I'd, I'd say that's probably the two sort of high level design features, but then what, what I think really matters the most is actually the data that's feeding into this rating systems. So we've got a large number of factors uh, that, that broadly can be broken into three different types of data. So Number one, we've got trade payments or transactional data. So um, as Pat mentioned, credit, credit Watch is capturing a, a large volume of what are essentially business to business transactions. And we use that data in a variety of ways. So number one, we, we pick up payments behavior. So yeah. we can see if you're paying the suppliers on time and, and things like that. Um, but we also use it in a positive sense. We also get a good picture of 
especially a business's trade footprint in terms of companies that have a large number of active trading lines and doing lots of transactions tend to be quite low risk. So it's not, it's not just a negative use of the data. Um, so that, that's number one. Number two, we've, we've put a lot of work into a wide range of different business demographic uh, data sources. So this type of information really tells you what sort of business you're, you're dealing with. So it's things like the industry, the maturity, how old the business is, even things around management structure, tax status, things like that. Uh, probably one interesting sort of feature in these models, again, using a machine learning technique, we've combined a lot of socioeconomic and macroeconomic data to provide really, really powerful measures of location risk. So down to a postcode level, we can actually find correlates of, of risk based on location. Um, and that tends to be really effective for your smaller businesses, so your private companies and, and, and sole traders as well. And then probably the third sort of piece of data is the what, what we'd call the more traditional bureau data, so the more the negative data, if you like, sort of um, monitoring sort of data from the courts and ABR and ASIC, um, measuring things like judgments, insolvencies and, and things like that. So I guess to summarise all that, what, what sort of looks different about these these models is really a broader range of data and probably a more balanced mix across those different data types. It's probably the, the best way I, I can describe it. And I think important to note there is um, it doesn't matter whether you are a, a sole trader yourself utilising Predator Watch and, and Risk Score or you're a you know, senior credit analyst at um, you know, one of the big four banks. It, it works regardless yeah. of how big you are, how big your credit limits are that you're dealing with with your customers, how many customers, how many new customers applications. It, it, it works across all entity sizes yeah. that, are, that are utilizing it from a credit standpoint. And then um, as, as, as James touched on earlier, just jumping back, there are five separate credit scoring models there. So, um, you know, something about, Credit Watch that, that was really unique when we started, we provided commercial credit reports on what we call unincorporated entities, so sole traders, trusts um, and partnerships. And, and the same thing happens here. You're able to, to get a credit score, oh, sorry, a risk score on um, any and all entities. Essentially, it's 99.9% .9 of entities out there. There are some very, very obscure ones that you probably shouldn't be dealing with anyway. Um, but if there's no score, that's, that's why there would be no score there. Um, I think the other big thing to, to ask the question of is it's, it's quite new for us, or sorry, not is quite new, it's, it's brand new, is, is the whole um, credit rating system that, that you have designed to, to sort of accompany um, uh, the new risk score. Yeah, so the credit ratings, and I've got a slide that's sort of, so people will notice that in the previous model there, there was a credit score, now we've got a credit score and a credit rating. The best way to think about credit ratings, they're really a, a convenience for underwriting. So even in your most sophisticated sort of larger banks, you know, you tend to summarise what comes out of these predictive models into a few categories that are, that are meaningful for, for credit decisions. So the credit rating scale is, is a simple way of classifying um, all businesses by an average risk. So in really simple terms, if you look at that table up on the on the screen there, so if you're at say C3 credit rating, you've got about a nine ten percent chance of, of, of defaulting effectively. So defaulting on your credit ob, um, obligations. So what that means is you know, businesses in that group, nine out of ten of them will, will be a good credit, but about ten percent are likely to go bad. Which would, for a, from a banker's point of view, might be considered pretty high risk. So you might the most way you might use this practically someone in that sort of category you might want to have a pretty good look at their balance sheet yeah. but if you're doing sort of short-term trade credit trade credit that, that might be perfectly acceptable for you so for anyone who's any any bankers on the line it's just to ground these into something familiar so that the c1 and c2 ratings would in terms of empirical average rates would map roughly to it let's say an s p single b so and that's where the majority of Australian businesses, small businesses, would fit in that sort of C1 and C2. Once you get start getting to the the, the high Bs and A's, you're sort of getting into that double and triple B type of risk. So, but if if, if, if S and P ratings don't mean anything to you, you can just look at the the default rate. So you'll see that you know if you're in those sort of A categories, you've got about a sort of ten basis point sort of default rate. So one in a thousand level of risk. 
Whereas once you start, once we, we downgrade or if a company starts out in those sort of D credit ratings, we'd say they're generally pretty high risk. Yeah, and either looking at cash on demand, not dealing with them or yeah, significant yeah. security against them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think where the rating is, um, you know, even more convenient is whether it's yourself who's assessing new credit applications or existing ones, or you have a team, it's a really good way to set um, specific sort of guidelines for your company or for your team, right? So you know that um, if something is in the in the A's or B's, fantastic, let's give them an approval. If it's a you know a C1, you have a slightly different approval methodology, and then anything below that, you start to adjust it. It could be it could be to do with credit limit, it could be to do with um, you know, moving them to COD up front or something like that. So it's a really good way, rather than just working off a 750 equals a, you know, straight through or above, you can actually work to the to the credit risk um, category itself or, or, or the rating itself, um, much more convenient. And also very transferable across all those different entity types as well, because a, a 650 in a, in a sole trader is going to be different yeah. to what could be in a, Oh, yeah. across. Yeah, so it's very helpful there as well. Um, I thought what James put together a really good slide that I'll jump to now that I'm, I'm sure he can he can chat to, which sort of looks at um, how it is distributed across private companies. Yeah. Um, and I know that you know you can kind of look at look at a, at a rating system and go, well, anything that's in the middle there naturally as a, as a non credit risk person. Uh, or someone who hasn't dealt a lot with credit ratings, they can naturally go, oh, well, anything that's a C is actually a really high risk and I don't want to deal with it, but it's not the case. And I think this slide, when, when I first saw it, was a, I'm a visual person, I'm not very technical, um, is a really good way to sort of um, clarify how, how that rating system works. Yes, yeah. Well, I think this, this, I believe this is for basically the bulk of private yeah, you regular, most businesses fall into this, this yeah. category. So you can see that sort of single B, so the C1 and C2, about 40% of Australian businesses. Now, whether that's a high or low risk actually might depend on what what sort of credit you're, you're giving. So yeah. if it's C2, you know, a, a lot of small businesses would be in that category. So a, a major bank might lend in that space, so they're, they're definitely required collateral. Yeah. Um, so, however, if you're doing trade credit under 50k, yeah, it's, a you, different, it's a different story. Yeah, what, what might surprise a lot of people, particularly anyone from the banks, is that quite a, a good sort of 20 30 percent of businesses are in those kind of high risk rates. Yeah, um, what, what's something you, you will find is different to a, a more traditional sort of bureau score in the, the use of that, that demographic data? You can actually get a weaker uh, credit rating based on your industry maturity and, uh, and other things so um, what the example i like to, to give is if you're in the retail trade business or trying to start a, a restaurant there's a lot of businesses in that category the liquidation rates for them are very high and particularly for new businesses so yeah, taking out all the other data. yeah so you, you just looked at liquidation rates. yeah so that, that's probably something for people to get their head around but um and look again that's the way kind of a banking underwriter would look at things so some of our customers have credit policies that will prevent lending to businesses that are less than two or three years old. Yeah. So what what you'll find is that you can get you know a relatively weak credit rating with a clean bureau record as such. And conversely, if you're a bigger company with a big trade footprint, um, you know, a large number of directors is one of the factors in the, in the model. So if you've got a board of directors and you're clearly a bigger company, in a lower risk industry, you can have some adverse information and still get a pretty good credit rating. So I think that's probably one of the key difference in, in my experience, a lot of bureau scores tend to act a bit more like a demerit system. In that yeah. you, you see with more sort of traditional bureau scores, you'll, you'll get, you'll have a good rating until you do something wrong. So this is, we would sort of see this as more of a balanced measure of risk. Yeah. Um, and I've just checked a question that, that came through here earlier, which I might talk to now is, you know, is this, um, are these scores dynamic, so to speak, or will they be reassessed? And I think um, I'll say very quickly, yes. And I think if you think about where we're at 
as a as an economy, as a country, we're in the middle of a recession, or technically we were in a recession, um, middle of a global pandemic that you know could be ending soon. But you just have to look at what happened in Victoria um, and and what's happening now, even in South Australia, how quickly things can change from from good to bad. Um, yes, we will be reassessing um, the scores, so they will change according to what is happening out there. Um, but also think what's important is to keep in mind is every every business in Australia is is probably more at risk than it was 12 months ago. Yeah. In bar some some obvious ones where there's been panic buying the yeah. words and, and the likes of after panic. Yeah. Yeah. So look, these, these models are under a, a regular monetary regime. So we actually watch them watch the models carefully. Um, and yeah, we're, Models like this, we will tend to re refit them at least annually, or by exception, if we see anything changing. Yeah. Um, just on that, please do ask questions. Um, if you do have any, you can do that in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, before I get into a, a quick sort of live demo, James, is there anything that I may have missed or you wanted to touch on before I do that? No. Look, I think I think we've given a good. Yeah, I mean, we can obviously get extremely more technical, and I think that's one of the, the great things about um, about Predator Watch, but also access to, to James and the Open Analytics team. Is if you do, you know, you do have more technical questions, and, and as I said at the beginning, I'm aware of the fact that we've got people who are very new to sort of credit management, running credit reports full stop, and then we've got at the other end, you know, those who are really into the statistics and data science behind how this works. I, I encourage you to, you know, to get in contact with us, ask questions. Um, we can always organise times to, to do uh, to do catch ups or phone calls and whatnot. So please don't be shy in asking a question. Let me jump in and we can have a look at Creditor Watch. So just so you're aware as well, um, on Creditor Watch, there's, if you want to watch a video of me, you can see how uh, nice and orange my beard is under the studio lights you can jump in there um, or you can go to the blog page itself there's probably a little bit more better information to come through on there come down taking the risk out of credit management there's a whole article dedicated to the new risk score which we have um, obviously just released there's a bunch of faqs in there how to read it who it's for a couple of case studies and then also importantly there's a really nice download um, that you can download, get access to, and even go into a little bit more information about how the score works and, and some of the things that um, James has been talking to today around the, the, the categorization and, and, and demographic data and the data itself and, and how it powers the risk score, risk score. Excuse me. Um, so what I wanted to show in the meantime is obviously where you can find the score and, and, and how to read it essentially. And James, of course, please feel free to jump in and interrupt if you want, if there's anything that you want me to flag. You can see here that we've made a few changes. We've got um, the risk rating itself. We've got the risk score and, and the category that it falls into. If you click on that, it will then take you down to the risk score itself. Um, you can see how the score compares to the average for similar entities, which is a really important one, something that's always been very popular um, with our previous credit score. We've then got a little bit of a, an explainer, so to speak, as to how, how to deal with this um, particular entity and, and its risk rating itself um, and, and or why it is at this um, particular level. So you can see unfavorable business, financial or economic conditions will likely impair the capacity or willingness to meet financial commitments, extend terms, closely monitor ongoing payment behaviour. One of the big things that we've done is we did leave the historical score in here. Now, um, I might throw to James here around um, why you shouldn't compare. Now, we've left it in there so you could historically see what you may have approved them for credit for or what you may have assessed them for credit, score, uh, credit for previously under the old credit score. Um, it's not a, 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 a comparison to make though, is yeah, it? It's a bit of a tricky one. So the new models are ultimately predicting a probability of an insolvency event. I'd say that the, the previous scores were a bit more like the more traditional approach was essentially a demerit system. So a, there's no one-for-one -one comparison between the, the old and new. So 
we hope that with the explanations here and the credit ratings that the most meaningful thing will be that rating and the, the likelihood of, of a default event. Yeah, and it's not a case of, okay, this has dropped. Are they, are they more risky all of a sudden? That's not the case. Maybe they are, but it's the way we are now assessing them under this risk score, their, their score has dropped. It could be possible that they're actually less risky than they were before. It's just a completely different scoring and, uh, and rating methodology that is being used. Of course, as always, if you do have questions, the best thing for you to do is reach out um, in order to see the, the rating recommendations. They are in here. We are making slight tweaks over the next few weeks, not to the score itself, but just to a few naming conventions and a few other things. Um, however, you know, everything should really probably stay the same to the naked eye. So this is a proprietary limited company, uh, a C2 rating. You can see here 7.8% chance of default within the next 12 months, um, taking into consideration, you know, what uh, James was talking about previously, we've got sort of 20% um, of all entities, private companies in this case, sort of falling into that, into that bucket. Um, it's obviously not the only thing you're going to use in order to assess it. You're going to use your own sort of market knowledge. You know that if you're uh, providing, you know, goods and services to the retail sector or the hospitality sector, you already know that they are one, one of the riskiest industries out there. So, um, you know, your, your, your aversion to risk um, is, is probably less than, you know, someone who, who's new to operating in that industry or is operating in a, in a far sort of safer industry, so to speak. The next one we've got here is a sole trader. You can see here D3, they've got a couple of defaults. Um, I believe the possible uh, previous bankrupt, a, a discharge bankrupt. Um, so you can see a D3 is certainly a, a higher risk rating than what we've just looked at, 22% chance of default within the next 12 months. And this is kind of a perfect example of where one's gone down, doesn't necessarily mean they are more risky. This one's gone up. We've actually assessed this um, completely different. Yeah, so it's a nice way. 300 like score under the old rating was, was very bad. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, this one was bad under, under both. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. in general speaking, you don't get the low to D's or E's unless there's some clear sort of behavioural problem. Yeah. In terms of, you know, either mispayments, defaults or, or worse. Yeah, or worse, yeah. And then the last one we have here um, is a trust. Clicking on here, you can see a really, um, really favourable rating and score here, A1. Um, this is a great entity to deal with. However, as we know, that's not the trust that you should be dealing with from a you know, trade credit or a security or a, you know, anything point of view, you really want to be dealing with the company behind it. And then maybe just touch on the sort of, you know, why is the, why is the score? generally higher for, for a trust, for example. Yeah, for, for most types of trusts are generally low risk. Often they're sort of a vehicle where you're parking money. So there's a lot of different types of trusts. There's everything from, you know, even self-managed super funds, yeah. family trusts, to trading trusts connected to a business. So what I'd say if you're dealing with, you know, those in the banking world would realise often when you're looking at a, a commercial entity, it, it's actually a combination of a multiple entities. So our advice generally would be if you're looking at a structure where you've got a trading company and a trust, it, and you even if you're lending only to the trust, I would, I would still look at the trading company. Yeah. Um, you can either you know use the rating of the trading entity or <laughs> probably more conservatively use the worst of the two ratings. Yeah. Worse. And I think from a you know keeping in mind you know the majority of our customers would be in that trade credit space. You certainly want to be dealing with the, the proprietary limited entity assuming it's a proprietary limited entity, but we know most of the time there is a company behind that trust um, because that's where you can ultimately um, get security, directors guaranteed, personal guarantees. You know, you can you can actually take the, the company to court rather than the trust. Um, yeah, in the banking world, you'll, you'll often get cross guarantees. So you're <laughs> covering everything. You're, you're making sure it's all legally connected. That's right. <laughs> um, and for those of you who have joined us before, you know, we've done, um, we've done plenty of trust um, webinars and articles uh, um, previously, so you know, jump onto the blog and, and search for those. Um, the Ledlands, uh, Ledland lawyers have been fantastic in providing insights in, in how to deal with trusts. So 
Uh, again, if you're unsure, have a look online. We've got plenty of uh, documentation um, in the blog uh, and or in the previous uh, webinar section, you'll be able to have a look at the webinars as well. Um, I'll jump back in here live demo we have done. Um, as I touched on earlier, there's plenty of additional resources that are available. The risk score brochure, there's a white paper, there's an article, and then of course there's the ability to, to call in and or email and, and inquire that way. We're always happy to have um, further discussions as well. I'm just going to have a look to have a look at uh, questions that may have come in. We've got a bit of time and it looks like there are a few questions. Um, let me just have a look here. There's a question around uh, court information, which I'll touch on. Yes, court data is certainly yeah. playing a part in, um, in the scoring. Uh, there's a question about getting access to you know, current action. Look, some of the courts will provide um, writs, some won't provide writs, so you've actually got to wait until the judgment. It really just depends on the court. So we're, we're always in discussions with the courts around how that data is provided, the frequency of it as well, and, and at what stage of, um, of the action. Um, we're always trying to push them to, to be providing that information as soon as they sort of get a, you know, a statement of claim almost, um, but that's not always the case, some of the courts work very differently to others. Some provide a, uh, a, an almost real-time or daily uh, API access and others are providing it on a monthly basis. So um, it's, there's no sort of um, hard and fast rule against that. Um, just jumping in to have a look at a few. There are going to be questions here that we'll have to come back to. Is there either quite intricate or, or niche? Um, do you have a recommended score for various category of suppliers subcontractor engagement? I might go first and if you can have a think about it from, from your point of view. Ultimately, um, the, 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 our credit reports and, and the risk score itself works traditionally for you know, uh, assessing a debtor, assessing a customer, but there's no reason why it can't be used to assess a, um, a, a creditor, a supplier, a subcontractor. Ultimately, it is looking at the health of that entity. Um, so it doesn't really matter which side of the ledger it's going to fall on. Um, if, if, if they are a risky debtor to someone else, that means they could be a risky supplier to you if you're reliant on them. Is that, is that Yeah, true? I'm just wondering how, I'm just maybe interpreting this question, um, it maybe if, if, that, if the, the question is really are there sort of benchmarks? Yeah, so, sure. Um, so I believe that we uh, can okay. generate sort of benchmarks by entity type, so the, the segments and by industry. Yeah. It's probably, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think, you know, I think it still rings true to treat them as if they, um, you know, whether they're a, we're a customer or a supplier, if you're a, a reliant on them, you want them sitting, you want them sitting in the, in the lower risk categories the same, the same way, regardless of which side of um, the ledger they are sitting on. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to have a quick quick look through. Is a, is the frequency of change down to daily timing? Um, well, it's even more frequent. Like it's, not, it's it's a lot. It's a it's a real time right. It's a real time score. Yeah, right? It's a real time score. So as I mentioned, the the predictors are sort of split into demographic type information, and that yeah. that doesn't change real time. But all the yeah, court actions, transactional, all the sort of dynamic factors, yeah, they're, they're basically real time. Yeah, so if you looked at it in the morning and there was no default, and you looked at it in the afternoon and there were yeah. defaults, the, the rating would change in response to that. Yeah, yeah that should probably... Um, looks in the comments, there is some interest in some benchmarks. So, yeah, that's yeah so that's a good one. So um, we'll, we'll note that down and um, have a think about that yeah. anyway. Um, we've just got a question here. If, if it, if a customer's credit score has changed, how do we internally assess these significant variances? You shouldn't actually be assessing the changes. What you can do is assess the entity based on the current, that this new this new risk score, right? You don't necessarily need to go, oh, it has changed from 750 previously and now it's 500. That's not the way we're intending it to do. Yeah. You should be assessing it on its own on its own merits. Assuming you just that way. Cut off the rest. See what the rating is on that. 
I think there's a rating. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what well, if if it's changed to a so six nine nine to five seven four. Yeah, I think we'd have to check what credit rating that that sits in. If if it's now getting a weaker credit rating, then potentially you should do something. Yeah. Um, I don't know the calibration of. Yeah, we need to actually have a look at the. the There's nothing the meaningful report about itself. 700 compared to the 574. Yeah. Um, but if five, so it really what matters is what that 574 maps to, and if we're saying it's high or medium risk. Yeah. That's changed. Um, something else that just came to mind as well for those larger organisations out there, whether it's banks, lending. There's even some some, some seriously big trade credit companies that we've spoken to, or if you think that you know your company would be interested in, there is the ability to create what we're calling at the moment a, a custom risk score. Yeah. Um, and essentially what that means is we're combining the, the credit watch data, which creates the, the existing risk score, but we're able to combine that data um, with your own internal um, customer data that you have and, yeah. and, 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 and then create a customised risk score yeah so basically for some organizations if you've got a some unique data which you, which, you, which can be used or b even if you've got a particular niche uh, customer base as well so you're concentrated in one industry or one type of entity um, if you're in either of those categories a customized type solution can, can help and the more the bigger more sophisticated um, credit managers like big four banks, effectively what they do is they they customise all of their scores. So again, yeah. it's one of those things where we, we've definitely had a lot of interest from from a number of clients, and then particularly in the I guess the the neo bank space. So yeah. Interested in where they're sort of targeting a certain demographic. We essentially can tweak a model and customise it to your data address and or you know customer base. Effectively. Yeah. So and just to be clear, that it's not. That, that custom risk score isn't just for, for lenders or big four banks. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it works really well there because they've generally got quite a bit of sort of trading data and um, historical payment yeah. information and whatnot. But also we're having discussions with some larger um, trade credit risk, uh, trade credit providers out there yeah. um, in, in, in hospitality, but also in you know, building and construction materials where they have a large customer base, they've got historical information on those customers, how those customers pay their bills, um, the, the sort of niche industries within those customer bases that might be, you know, have a higher uh, default or bad debt rate. And we're able to utilise all of that information combined with the credit watch information to produce a, you know, company XYZ score, yeah. right? For lack of a better term, yeah. Um, look, I'm conscious of time. I know there are other questions that have come through here. Um, we will um, we will get back to you. It's not the time to to go through every single one of them today. We will get back to you in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours, whether it's an email or a phone call from myself or James or even um, one of our one of our customer service managers. I do appreciate. Um, the questions that have gone into this. So thank you. I don't want you to feel that we're ignoring you, but I'm also conscious of everyone's time as well. As always, um, please do uh, contact us if you have any questions on top of those ones that you um, that you have sent through. What I might do is I can run a quick poll as we usually do to say, do you want to be contacted by Creditor Watch? It's a good opportunity for us to really identify who wants to be contacted and we can get through to you um, or we can prioritise a, a call or an email to you, regardless of whether you've asked a question or not. Um, and, and that could be to discuss the credit score, uh, the risk score or, um, or anything else. You don't have to say yes, just for the risk score. If you want to talk about product data, uh, the business risk review that we released last week um, or anything like that, please just select yes and we'll be in contact. Give that another sort of five, 10 seconds um, before we wrap up for the day. All right. Actually, while we're doing that, James, I'll take the opportunity to say thank you very much for joining us. I don't think this will be the last time we, um, we run a, a session on the risk score. There's plenty of appetite for more information. And I think potentially what we could even look at uh, next time around is, is delving into it from an even more sort of technical perspective for those that, that want to 
nerd out, so to speak. Yeah, you're welcome. And yeah, I'd extend that invite from us as well. We're, we've met with a lot of Credit Watch customers and we're always happy to to meet with anyone and, and give a lot more detail than we've yeah. given today. So. Yeah, great. Thank you for, for joining us. I appreciate the time. Close that poll down. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, appreciate your time. Um, we love having everyone on board. Fantastic number of um, attendees today, which is good. Of course, we are recording it, so we'll get the recording out to you and uh, the slides as well. Um, from us at Creditor Watch, James, Open Analytics, thanks again and have a fantastic week.